realize we should probably start recording. All right, the recording will just be missing all the all the uh, the boring stuff anyway. Um, does anybody have any questions? Go away. Does anybody have any questions about the homework assignment at this point? Has anybody started looking at that? Maybe we might be offset by a week by now. We might be a little bit slower. So the homework might not make a lot of sense until after today's lecture um, for the counting protons and neutrons and stuff. Is it that one? All right. So no, you don't have any questions about that yet because you don't know what's going on yet. So let's do, just do some practice with energy and phase change here. It's new. Um, let's say we've got this metal. This is a really cool metal. Gallium is awesome because gallium melts between room temperature and body temperature. So gallium is a lot of fun to play with because if you take a piece of solid gallium and you hold it in your hand, it'll melt in your hand which is really cool. And then you can drop it on some or put it down and it re-solidifies. Um, if gallium melts at 29.7 degrees Celsius, draw the heating curve for a piece of gallium that starts at room temperature and ends at body temperature. So remember heating curve is just when you chunk it up into temperature increases or phase changes, right? It's that. temperature versus Q graph. So when I have you draw these heating curves, I'm not looking for anything done to scale necessarily. If you can make it to scale even better, but I'm not gonna be grading you on that. It's just mainly, can you show me what's happening qualitatively? So if we started at room temperature and we started putting energy in, the temperature is gonna go up until it hits a phase change, right? And so since gallium, it's a substance you don't have that much experience with, but I'm telling you where a phase change is. A phase change is at 29.7. So then it goes through a phase change where you keep putting energy in, but nothing changes. The temperature doesn't change anyway. And then once it's all melted, the temperature can start going up again. So that's all that, that I mean when I say draw a heating curve or a cooling curve, right? Pretty straightforward. If we want to actually know the total amount of energy to get to liquid gallium at 36.5 degrees Celsius, I think that's not the number that you uh, would actually measure in Celsius for somebody's body temperature. That's the, that's skin temperature, not so the difference. You know, your skin is not ninety eight point six degrees, right? Thirty eight. We decided thirty eight degrees Celsius. I think is internal body temperature in Celsius. What was it? Thirty seven. Okay, thirty seven. I don't deal with living organisms when I can help it. So. So if we want to know the total amount of energy, though, we just have to find the total energy for each of these pieces. We've got Q1, Q2, 
and Q3. And Q1 and Q3 have a slope, right? And they have a change in temperature. And anytime there's a change in temperature, we know what equation to use, right? And Q2 doesn't have a change in temperature. It's a phase change. So we're going to use one of those delta H terms and just make the units work out. It's joules per gram. So if you know how many grams you have, you can use it like a conversion. All right, so for Q1, take the mass of gallium. So Q is equal to mass times specific heat times delta T. We just need to make sure we're being consistent with what we plug in. Everybody who had lab on Monday got some experience with that, right? I think the most common mistake out of all the groups was trying to use delta T for the water when it should have been delta T for the metal or trying to use specific heat of the water when it should have been for the metal, right? Keeping track of specific heat of what is really tricky. So in this case, we have a mass of the solid, specific heat of the solid, delta T of the solid. So mass is 7.805 grams. Specific heat of the solid, 0 0.371 joules, grams, degrees Celsius. And delta T for the solid or for, for step one, to be where you hit the phase change and where you started. So 29.7 is your final for step one and 21.0 is your, your initial. So 8.7, right? So when we plug all that in, what do we get for Q1? So 25.2 and how many sig figs do we get to keep? Just the two because of Delta T, right? Delta T only has, um, only has two sig figs. So we only get to keep two sig figs here. So 0.37 times eight, we'll call it 10, there's three times, yeah, that seems like a reasonable number, right? When you look at the sides of all the numbers we're talking about. Q3, sometimes it's helpful to just do all your temperature change ones at the same time, because they're gonna look so similar. You're using the same equation. The only thing that's different well, I guess two things are different. Your specific heat is different once it's a liquid and your delta T is different once it's a liquid, right? But you plug in some different numbers, do the exact same math though. And for Q3, we would get 0.3. What do we get for that? I was going to go straight to Q3 since it's the same same type of equation. Or 21 joules. Good. So then the last one, the the phase change, we can just write as a as a simple conversion. Right, we don't have any delta T, so we can't use the delta T equation. That's your, that's your dead giveaway that you shouldn't be using your delta T equation is if the temperature is not changing, which makes sense, right? If delta T is zero, you're not going to get a number that makes sense. So for Q two, it's just going to be the mass times delta H. I don't usually even write it as its own equation though, because that's just one more equation to memorize or put on the equation sheet. You just look at the units for it. You say, okay, well, 
for any, we're going to see lots of delta H's, especially if you go into gen chem, and we're going to start seeing them in slightly different units where it's something like kilojoules per mole. But it's the same process. You don't need an equation. You just need to know that joules per gram means it's a conversion. If anybody feels really strongly that you would really like that on the equation sheet for the final, then the, during dead week before finals week, tell me about it. And we'll talk about why you think that's so necessary. And if, if you convince me, then I'll put it on there. Um, but I'm not going to do it right now because you just need to practice, I think. And most of you will figure out that you don't actually need an equation for that. In fact, it does more harm than good because it's confusing. All we really need is to say one gram equals 80.2 joules in order to melt. So wind up with something around 150? No, 60. No, what did I do? 6,000, 600. Six twenty six, and we get to keep all three sig figs, right? So the total amount of energy for the whole process is just add up all the pieces, Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3, just like we've seen, right? So our Q total would be 672. Six seventy one. Uh, six. It depends on where you did your rounding. If you didn't round until uh, till the very end, um, then you might have wound up rounding down in one. So six seventy one or six seventy two is the same for sig figs. Based on the rounding that I have shown here, it should be six seventy two. Because one and five and six is twelve. All right, so we're feeling pretty good about energy right now until we make it more complicated. Notice that that's a, a very common theme in science in general, but especially in chemistry, is I'll get you comfortable with, with one concept or one technique, and then we're gonna say, but really that's not accurate enough. Really, we need to make things more complicated in order to really show what's happening. So every time you get comfortable, I'm just gonna take it and make it more complicated. And then you'll get comfortable again, and we make it more complicated again. It's a common meme on uh, chemistry forums is everything you learned in Gen Chem is wrong. It's not wrong, it's just oversimplified. It's not complicated enough yet. All right, so we talked about this a little bit when we talked about matter, um, but we're going to really dissect it a little bit more today. Um, so we talked, started with that, that thought experiment where we said, okay, when we, if we start by dividing a piece of copper wire in half and we just keep, take those pieces and we divide those in half and we take those pieces and we divide those in half and we just keep going, one of two things has to happen. Either you could keep going infinitely, you could make your piece of copper infinitely small, or you reach a point where you can't cut it in half anymore and have it still be copper. And so that's, that's the two approaches that the ancient Greeks took. And they basically, because they didn't have the scientific method, um, they just argued about it. It was just more about who was better, a better speaker um, or who had better name recognition. Um, you could think of the, uh, it's just occurred to me, the original Greek philosophers were the original influencers. They just wanted to be, you know, controlling the conversation. They didn't really have any way of testing any of their ideas. So Democritus is matter made of, said that matter is made of small indivisible particles that he called atoms. And he's famous for this quote, nothing exists but atoms in empty space, everything else is opinion, um, which is kind of fun to dissect on its own. Uh, Aristotle had the opposite 
matter can be infinitely small and you just had different amounts of the four primary elements um, mixed together, made all the different types of matter. Everything was made out of earth, wind, fire, water um, with in varying amounts. Um, so Aristotle won that argument in, in the court of public opinion, mostly because he was Aristotle, burned all of Democritus's writings once Democritus died, um, and everybody forgot about it for a few thousand years until enlightenment in the, um, I want to say, I looked this up the other day, um, I think the early 1500s, this idea came back around um, when they first started considering chemistry and actual science. Scientific method had been um, become widespread by then. And they basically had, they started doing chemistry um, and they, they came across these three physical laws. And so remember that the difference between a law and a theory in science is what? Exactly. So a theory explains how or why. A law just tells you what happens. So these were laws because they didn't know why they happened at first. They noticed that you had conservation of mass. When, you, when a reaction happens, you wound up with the same amount of mass that you started with. Okay, cool. Um, a guy named Proust realized that law of def definite proportions was that if you had a certain reaction that happened, you had to have the same ratio of hydrogen to oxygen, for example, or the same ratio of nitrogen to oxygen by mass in order for the reaction to happen properly. You always made the product it is a, as a certain amount based on the proportions of what you started with. In other words, they figured out that these chemical reactions were like a, a recipe for cookies. You had to have the right amount of baking powder. You had to have the right amount of flour and the right amount of chocolate chips or nothing happened. Or you got something that was drastically different than what you intended. And then a guy named Dalton figured out that the ratios happened to be in whole number. You could only combine them in whole number ratios, um, which was really weird until they thought about the idea that of atoms. And so Dalton was the first one to put forward a, a modern atomic theory, which is every element is comprised of tiny indestructible particles called atoms. And atom in Greek just literally means indivisible. Uh, T-O-M is something, is the root that means to break or something like that. And A means without. So literally translates as without breaking. Um, and all atoms of a given element have the same mass and other properties that distinguish them from other elements. So now we're not talking earth, wind, fire, water anymore. We're talking about elements like on the periodic table, but they didn't have the periodic table. They just knew that hydrogen was a thing. So this number two basically just says hydrogen's different than every other element um, because it has these different properties. And number three is atoms combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. We'll define some of these terms again in a second, but essentially you, could, you can't have a part of an atom. If it's indestructible, indivisible, you don't get to use a piece of a hydrogen atom. You either use one hydrogen atom or zero hydrogen atoms, right? And so that's what they, is meant by simple whole number ratios. In mathematical terms, it has to be a discrete number an integer. And then number four is atoms cannot change from one element to another. They can only change how they are bound to other atoms. So this is pretty cool. That seems like kind of a stretch based on those three laws from before, but it's really the only thing that made those three laws make sense in conjunction with each other. And that's why it's a theory. It explains why those laws behave the way they do. Anybody see any issues with these four postulates? Is there anything wrong? Given what you know, you get allowed to take your modern knowledge and use that at this point. Atomic bomb. Atomic bomb. Atomic bomb was referred to as what? 
splitting the atom, right? So that whole like indestructible piece, okay, maybe that we put an asterisk on that, maybe normally indestructible. Um, but where it does still apply is that you get to a point where if you cut an atom in half, you don't get the same element back. So basically we added a qualifier to it. So it's comprised of tiny particles called atoms that can't be divided without changing the element. So if you have an atomic bomb that started as uranium and that all those uranium atoms went through a fission reaction, they're not uranium anymore. They still have more or less the same mass. They still have more or less the same number of, of particles, but they're not uranium anymore. And so that means that number four doesn't really apply either, right? By adding that asterisk for number one, we're also throwing out number four because we can't we can change. A nuclear reaction does change what elements you have. In fact, that's how we make new elements. We talked about that a little bit with super colliders, right? Slam the nuclei together hard enough and you get a new nucleus that's not the same element as either of what you started with. So all of these need to be adjusted, but that's kind of how the scientific method works, right? The whole idea is, well, we have this understanding of how atoms work, but when we get new evidence, it says, well, really number one's not quite true. And here's why. Then we add an asterisk and say, well, it's true except for these cases. And here's why these cases are different. It's the same thing that, that quantum mechanics and relativity did for Newton. So Newton was the physicist who came up with laws of gravitation and, and you know, figured out how, how um, orbits work. When relativity and quantum mechanics came along, they didn't throw out Newton's work. They amended it. They said, well, Newton's laws work except for these conditions. If you're in these conditions, you need these other set of rules, right? So that it kind of, when it's a common refrain sometimes among people that, that are trying to argue against scientists that, well, science is changing all the time. So why bother believing any of it? Because it's not really changing. We're just making it better all the time. So, you know, I'll use flat earth as an example. I'm not trying to pick on, on anybody, but this is one that we can actually measure, right? Um, if somebody says, okay, well, the earth is flat. And then somebody else says, well, no, we have evidence that says Earth is, is round, is a, is a sphere. And then somebody else comes along and says, well, really, it's not a sphere. It's an oblate spheroid, spheroid, because it's well, vaguely egg-shaped in some places. Is it just as wrong to say the Earth is flat as it is to say the Earth is a sphere? They're both wrong technically, but one's a lot closer to being right. Right, so making small adjustments doesn't mean you throw out everything along the way or that you can't trust science because it's always changing. It just means that we're getting closer to truth and to um, our better understanding the more we make these amendments. Let's see, are there any other, two and three are pretty good for now. They do need to be amended a little bit. Three. Three works if we change simple to discrete or integer. Simple is a bit of a stretch though, because when you start getting things like proteins, um, you know, when the molecular formula is something like C 20,122, H 10,075, O, I don't know, 328. Is that really a simple ratio? I guess by mathematical standards, but not by the common usage of the word simple. Um, and two, when we talk about isotopes, like, okay, well, they all have one property that makes them a certain element. We define elements by one property that we'll talk about later. Um, but it's not, they have the same, that all properties are identical for every atom of a certain element. So let's talk about Mendeleev, more history of science. So after Dalton's atomic theory, they started chemistry entered a golden age. People started figuring out all sorts of different stuff that you could do and how, how these things worked. Um, Mendeleev was this, this Russian chemist um, whose life reads like a Tolstoy novel, you know, born to a middle-class family, um, 
his dad was a English was a literature professor at a um, at a university. Then his dad went blind um, when Men Menelev was like the youngest of either 17 or 19. We're not quite sure, but he was he was the baby of a very large number of children and was born into the lap of luxury more or less until his dad went blind. And you can't teach literature if you can't see. And there were no protections in 1800s in Russia for you know, disabilities. So his dad just got tossed out of the university. Um, so then his family's penniless. He's still a kid. His mom gets a job working in a factory that her uncle owns. And OK, they're still middle class doing OK uh, until the factory burns down a year later, at which point they decide to just leave St. Petersburg across the entire country um, in the 1800s. So it's you know pre pre Trans Siberian Railroad. Um, and got him into a basically a boarding school where he got tutored because she thought he was really smart and he was going to be really good at science. Turned out he was. He was just really, really not very nice. Um, which I mean, he's got kind of the backstory that justifies being a bitter old man. But still, um, he was so mean that um, this is literally the guy who invents the periodic table. This is where we're going with this. He invented the periodic table, and yet when they discovered new elements, they named new elements for his bitter rivals, the Germans. Germanium, he predicted the existence of somebody else, not in Germany or Russia, found it, and they named it Germanium almost as a direct FU to Mendeleev. Like that tells you about something about how his relationships were with his, his co-workers and, and the other professionals, right? Um, in fact, he was eligible for to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry. He was nominated a few times. Um, again, literally the guy who invented the periodic table never won the Nobel Prize in chemistry because nobody liked him. And once you die, you can't win Nobel Prize. They don't award Nobel Prizes posthumously. So. And it took him until about 100 years after he died before he even got an element named after him. Again, he invented the periodic table. Don't be a dick. It's a lesson here. <laughs> and the way he figured this out um, is up until this point, everybody just had tables of, of elements where they just had them listed at the back of a book, like an index. And they were just listed alphabetically, typically. Um, according to whatever language you happen to be reading in. Um, but Mendeleev realized that if you arrange them by atomic mass, if you arrange them by how much the atoms weighed, patterns showed up. So he noticed that every eight elements, you had, uh, you had things that had similar properties. So helium is, was eight elements away from neon, and they both had similar properties. Neon was eight elements from argon that had similar properties. And so what Mendeleev did was he's just, well, I'm just going to take everything that has similar properties and I'm going to put it in the same column of the table and make rows and columns. And every column has similar properties. And got an early version of periodic table. Um, his didn't look quite like that. This is actually, I don't know why, but this is actually written in, was written in Italian. I'm not sure why the Russian chemist would be writing things in Italian, but um, this is one of the earliest examples we have of a periodic table, and it still doesn't look that good to us, doesn't look that much like the periodic table we know, um, but it has very distinct gaps in it where he said, basically Mendeleev proved, well, there should be something here because you've got an element that reacts like calcium over here and you've got titanium over here What's, there should be something in between. There's a gap in the table. And so this is very early on how they were able to, to know where to look. Because it turns out gallium is really close to uh, aluminum in some of its properties. And so they knew about gallium. It was just mixed in with aluminum. So they didn't realize that it was two different elements. It was just present in such small amounts they didn't realize that it was just an impurity of aluminum. They thought aluminum had just a different mass than what we know we now know. Um, and so he was able to predict not just that they should be there, but also what their properties should be like, which 
you know, back then this was a really, really big advance. Um, he didn't quite know why it behaved like this. It took quantum mechanics and Niels Bohr in particular and a couple of, and a couple of other um, quantum mechanics um, folks to really be able to show this. And we'll talk about that next week. Um, but it turns out it's because every row on the periodic table corresponds to a different energy level, which they had no idea. They just knew it was more of a law at that point. They knew that it behaved this way. They didn't understand why. So that's cool. We're getting a lot done, right? In terms of we're, we're fast forwarding through hundreds of years of scientific innovation in, in uh, 10 slides here. Um, makes it seem like this was all really straightforward and easy, right? Um, I mean, there's a lot of back and forth and arguing and acrimony and Mendeleev being a dick involved in the, the process in between. Um, but one of the main things that happened, and this is really where we start seeing the blurring of the lines between physics and chemistry, is they had Dalton's atomic theory said that everything's made out of atoms, right? And atoms are indestructible. We already said that, well, it's not really indestructible. Here's one of the first ways they knew it wasn't indestructible, was they found these things that they called cathode rays. And basically, if you took two, two pieces of metal and you applied a strong enough voltage to them, you could get these tiny little particles that, that flew out from one end of this tube to the other end of this tube, and they were smaller than hydrogen. And hydrogen was known to be the smallest element. So if you can get pieces of the, or if you can get these, these particles that are 2000 times smaller than hydrogen, then that means that, and it, the other pieces, they're identical no matter what material you use, no matter what metals you put at either end, you could make the same particles. That tells you that atoms are themselves made up of something smaller, right? If you can take an atom and you can get a smaller piece from it, it means that an atom is not the smallest thing out there, right? Kind of makes sense. So if atoms are made of smaller building blocks and these building blocks are the same for every element, does anybody know what we call cathode rays now? Close. They're worse for you. Well, that is worse for you. Um, electrons. So what he discovered, I believe this was Thompson in uh, Scotland. Um, Thompson discovered electrons. I mean, how do you really discover something that everybody is made up of? It becomes a point of philosophy, I guess, at that point. Is it really a discovery if everybody already is made up of that object? It's a rediscovery. Um, yeah, but essentially, we discovered electrons. Uh, and this is also where the, where what early TVs were made out of. They, you know, CRTs, cathode, stands for cathode ray tube. It was basically a setup like this. Um, except that on the inside of a piece of glass, you deposited a film of molecules that when you hit them with a high energy electron, they glow for a second. And so you could, if you had used magnets, you could direct where these electrons were flying. So early TVs basically were just firing electrons and then using magnets to control where those electrons hit that screen to make it light up. Um, which is why... So I'm dating myself here, but early computers always looked really funny. If you took like a magnet and you put it on top of your monitor, it made the color go all wonky up in that by the magnet. You could you know, move the magnet around in the front and it looked all weird. Um, that's because you're literally influencing where those electrons are hitting that, that screen. You're basically deflecting them from where the computer is telling them to go. Um, LEDs don't work like that, so you can't do that anymore. But if you have an old CRT around anywhere, you can play around with that. They also had that funny button it's called degauss or something like that that basically like reset everything and made the screen go all wavy for a minute. Spent a lot of time playing around with computer parts when I was a kid, clearly. All right. So let's do a thought experiment. <laughs> 
if atoms are neutral, meaning they don't have a charge, but the electrons are negative, and we can, and electrons are one of the pieces of an atom, what else do we know about atoms? There's gotta be a positive. If there's electrons and yet it still adds up to zero, you have to have something with a plus. Sam? Protons, exactly. Um, although the first thing they did was say, well, okay, well, we have these atoms that have electrons in them. Um, so the electrons, we can make the electrons fly out if we apply enough voltage to it. Um, so they, they refer to this as the plum pudding model. It basically was the idea that an atom was just a, a gelatinous mass that had electrons sort of embedded in it. And if you put enough voltage to it, you could get those, yes. those electrons to fly out. Um, and if you're unsure, a plum pudding, this is because these, these guys were all British and plum pudding was a British dessert that, that at least to me sounds pretty foul. Um, but that's, that's in keeping with British cuisine. Um, it's basically a fruit cake with plums. And that, that's a plum pudding right there. Um, doesn't sound appealing to me, but I don't like cooked fruit. So maybe other people like it. It's kind of fallen out of favor, probably because we now know how to make better food. Um, so the plum pudding model was this idea. And so Thompson, Thompson discovered the electrons, came up with the plum pudding model. And then his protege or his grad student, essentially, although they didn't use the term at the time, but basically his student who was training to be a research scientist under him said, okay, well, I can come up with an experiment to show that this is accurate. And he came up with the idea that, okay, what I'm going to do is, let's see if I have the figure. Yeah. So I'm going to fire alpha particles, which an alpha particle is a type of radiation that has a positive charge to it. So don't worry too much about what it is yet. But basically they knew how to make these. They knew they were positively charged. And so he said, okay, if I can fire these alpha particles at a really thin sheet of gold atoms, they should be able to go through it and come out the other side, just moving slower, right? They'll just go right through it, but they'll have slowed down because they had to go through the, the plum pudding. Um, and so what he actually saw though, is not, not that at all. What he actually saw is that when he fired these alpha particles, at this gold foil, um, they used gold because gold is really, really malleable, which from, from Latin malle malleus means hammer. Um, gold is malleable because you can take it and literally hammer it really, really, really thin to like only a few atoms thickness um, and still have it be nice, even surface. Um, so we made this gold foil, fired alpha particles at it, and almost all of them went right through it they weren't deflected, they didn't slow down at all. It acted like the gold foil wasn't even there. But some of them bounced off in really surprising angles. And they were always the same angles, which was weird. And so basically what Rutherford did was he disproved his mentor's pet theory, um, which is, you know, I'm sure that Thompson wasn't particularly pleased, but this is how science works, right? We have an idea, we test the idea. If it doesn't work, we have to throw out the old idea. Um, so totally opposite of what he was expecting to have happen. And the only way that Rutherford could make this make sense is if he said, okay, well, all of the mass and all of the positive charge is concentrated in one tiny little area in the middle of the atom that he called the nucleus. And the only time there was any sort of deflection of those alpha particles was when it happened to either directly hit the nucleus and bounce off, or if it got close enough that the positive charge in the nucleus pushed it away a little bit. And that happened really, really predictably because 99.99% of the volume of an atom is just the electrons and the alpha particles just tore right through it. And so to give you an idea of how small these nuclei are, um, if you've ever been to a professional baseball game, 
at a big park. So think Oracle Park, but the Coliseum works too. I don't know why you'd go to the Coliseum, but I guess it's cheap. Um, picture holding a baseball standing on, on the pitcher's mound. The baseball is the size of the nucleus. The rest of the stadium is the size of the electron cloud. So we're talking about a tiny, tiny little area is right in the middle, which is why almost all of those alpha particles didn't even notice it. They just went straight through and got collected on the other side. And they figured all of these others, you might actually notice, I don't, this is the first time I've actually noticed this on this figure. I don't think it's an accident that that, that that middle line is perfectly parallel on both sides of the foil, and that the one that's straight at the top is directly perpendicular to it. Because all of these atoms arrange themselves in a very predictable geometric pattern. So it happened to be, if you had an, an alpha particle traveling just the right angle, it's either gonna hit the first row of atoms, but if it misses that one, it might hit the second row of atoms, but at a slightly different angle. Or it might hit the third row of atoms at a slightly different angle. And it always got reflected off in the same direction. Think about the game, think about Plinko. Is anybody else be enjoying um, Plink, uh, Price is Right? It's is like 24 seven on, uh, on Amazon Prime now. Um, my kids know all about the prices of groceries from the 70s. Um, <laughs> But think about Plinko if those nails were five feet apart. Most of those Plinko chips just go right through the middle. But if you happen to be dropping them like a rain of Plinko chips, they predictably bounce off in the same directions every time if you dropped it from just the right spot. And it might not hit the first one, but it might hit the second one and go a different predictable direction. So they could actually work out the geometry using trig. They could figure out how, where the atoms had to be and how close the nuclei had to be to each other. A little bit in that it's, it's predictable on average. You might not be, be able to predict the result of any one trial, but you can predict the average results. And we'll talk about that a lot more with quantum as well. Um, but it's, and it's a little bit like odds in a casino, right? You might not be able to use odds to predict exactly what's gonna happen on one roulette spin, but you know, on average, the house is going to win. Unfortunately, I guess fortunate for the house. They wouldn't be there if they weren't making money. Um, all right, so to recap, and then we'll take a break. We figured out most of the atomic mass, oh, sorry, this is, this is the Rutherford's nuclear theory. So this is an amendment to the atomic theory. So basically, okay, we, do, we know that atoms aren't indestructible. So here's our asterisk for, for number one. Most of the mass is concentrated in a nucleus. The positive charge is in the nucleus. The nucleus is made of a discrete number of protons, which that seems like a bit of a stretch. But on the other hand, if electrons have to be a whole number of objects and your charges are going to cancel each other out, you also have to have a whole number of positive charges too, right? We can't deal with partial electrons and we also can't deal with partial protons. And then the electrons spread themselves around the nucleus and balance out the charge if it's neutral, if it's not. So in an atom in an element. We'll define that more closely in a second, right? And so this means that out of all the things on the periodic table, the only thing that's different about all those elements is varying amounts of protons and electrons. So we have even fewer building blocks than we thought. If you think of the periodic table, we can think of that as basically like a, a box of Legos that you can put together in different combinations to make everything in, in existence. This is basically saying the Legos themselves are made up of only a few pieces mixed together in different ratios. You added the red dye or you added the yellow dye, for instance, maybe um, to continue the Lego analogy. All right, so let's take a break there.
Let's come back at five after and we'll get into how we can actually use the periodic table. Yeah. So in the future, let me know ahead of time so because I need to make sure we have room. But I think for this lab, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. All right. If it was one of the if it was one of the top two, I wouldn't do this, but the ground is pretty safe to mess around with. Yeah. You're unlikely to really start a fire or like do yourself. Plus, that's what circuit, circuit breakers are for. But yes, you can you can charge it up here while I'm while I'm screwing around with this. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe are they all broken like that? Thank you. 
Sam, you can plug it in up here. Or over Thank you. 
For this lab, yes. If it was a, if it was not this lab, then they, they would have to be a no. Okay. But but because this is not a dangerous lab, we're okay. Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay. Back. Nancy, right next to you, is from the other lab too, so she won't have a, a group mate normal or a normal group mate today either. So you guys work together. <laughs> All right. So I did find a figure showing some of the geometry of that gold foil experiment. If all of these lines coming in are the um, are alpha particles, all of the orange ones, the ones that basically never get close to another nucleus, so they just pass through, no change in their speed, no change in their direction. But you can see how because these atoms, if they, they behave basically like spheres, and you can if you picture filling up the bottom of a of a um, moving box with ping pong balls so that you have like several layers of ping pong balls. They don't, they're not just random. When you pack them in as closely as you can, they tend to arrange themselves in certain shapes. Typically, if we're talking about packing spheres as closely as possible, they, they form these hexagonal shapes where, you, where every atom in, in the middle has six nearest neighbors around it, which is, basically the most efficient use of space um, when it comes to occupying the space and filling things up. So one of the reasons that nature tends to have lots of hexagons that show up, um, even in, when biology is not concerned, not just honeycomb, but even in things like um, mineral samples, you wind up with a lot of minerals that will form these really nice, neat hexagons to the point where people thought that these minerals were actually made by ancient civilizations. A lot of like ruins or the um, myths around things like Atlantis and ancient lost civilizations. Um, the evidence that they have for that a lot of times are these really straight lines and hexagonal shapes. And it's really just atoms tend to pack into hexagons when you pack them as tightly as possible. Um, so a lot of times those are naturally occurring formations. They just look man-made because they have such crisp lines and angles to them. Um, and what that, the result of that is also when you try to bounce tiny particles through it, 
they're also going to get deflected at predictable angles because all the ones that happen to be going in the same direction that are right here are going to bounce off at the exact same angle this way, or at least close enough that you're going to measure both of these protons bouncing or these L particles bouncing off over here are going to show up in basically the same spot. And all the ones that have a minor deflection are going to show up in about the same spot. So you don't get diffraction like a rainbow where you take things and spread it out evenly. You get it in very specific angles and it's all based on the geometry here. Um, and that's actually how the first way that they figured out how to measure atomic structure, the molecular structure of things like proteins and DNA was basically make a crystal out of it where all your molecules pack together as tightly as possible and fire x-rays at it. And the angles that the x-rays bounce off at tell you where you have a nucleus. And then you can work out, you can work backwards from there. Say, okay, well, if I have a nucleus here and I have a nucleus here, that's this distance apart um, corresponds to the distance between two carbon atoms in, in, normal, in a normal bond. But the distance or the angle that it forms over here, that corresponds, this one over here corresponds to an oxygen because it formed a certain bond angle and a certain bond length. So they basically took they basically just got crazy with, with trigonometry and sine and cosine and Pythagorean theorem and measuring angles to figure out exactly where every nucleus is in one of those, one of those things. And proteins are really, really big. Um, so even as recently as the early 90s, it would be an entire five-year PhD project just to find the structure of one protein because first you had to figure out a way to make it crystallize out. And then you had to bounce x-rays off of it and then take these little tiny dots of light showing up at random angles and use trigonometry to figure out what they bounced off of and where. And then you had to draw it in three dimensions without the help of a computer because they didn't have computers that had graphical interfaces that could actually display that. Now it's all been automated to the point that you just feed your x-ray diffraction data into a program and it'll spit out the structure. Um, but it used to be like a five year long project working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Um, so I'm glad that that was before my time and I never had to do that. Um, it seems very monotonous. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what Mendeleev got wrong in addition to being um, unpleasant to be around. Um, it turns out that it's not the the mass of the atoms that dictates what element we have because they they also figured out this one um that a i'll go back in a second um hydrogen was known to have one proton be the smallest element and helium was the second smallest element and they figured out that it had two protons so they were able to just work backwards and say, well, there has to be something else. If helium has two protons, but it's four times heavier, there has to be something making up that extra mass. And so they just called that, well, it can't have a charge because it's not throwing off our charge of our, per, of our um, atoms. So they called it neutron just for neutral. Um, so you've got electrons, protons, and neutrons are all of the pieces that make up all of our atoms. And the neutrons were really just discovered this, it was this simple. There has to be something else there because there's extra mass. It's a lot like dark matter. They just started by calling it a neutron because they knew it had to be neutral. So what they originally, what they figured out when they discovered the neutrons is that all the different elements were defined by the number of protons, not by their mass. So Mendeleev said, we'll just put them in order by, from largest to smallest. And that's going to define our periodic table. But then a couple of decades later, they came along and said, well, no, really, it's the number of protons that define an element. Every atom of a certain element has the same number of protons in the nucleus. All right? So, and we, we just call that number the atomic number that simple. It's what makes the, an atom a certain element is the atomic number. Um, so basically atomics, and so then atomic symbol 
is the name of the element, um, is related to the name of the element, they're really a little bit redundant. We don't technically need names for any of these. All we really need for the periodic table is the atomic number. But it's easier to remember things sometimes when you have a name for it. Um, so we have atomic symbol and atomic names um, or an element names that are just basically synonymous. Sodium, this, the symbol for sodium is Na. The atomic number is always 11. So really all you need is the atomic number to know where it is on the periodic table. Um, a couple notes about those symbols. They're all going to be one or two letters and to make sure that you can differentiate in a formula, whether or not you're talking about a different element or the second letter of the same symbol, you always make sure that the symbol always has the first letter capitalized. And the second letter is always lowercase because that allows us to not mix up things like uh, chlorine and carbon and iodine. So chlorine has the atomic symbol of Cl. If you just write it like that, though, it's unclear whether that's chlorine or a carbon and an iodine. Carbon has a is capital C and iodine is capital I. So when we're writing these, we need to sit in another place and then be thinking about capitalization. It needs to be unambiguously clear that that's an L. So there's a couple ways you can do that. You can put a little tail on it. But you don't want the tail to be too big because then it looks like a capital L. Okay. The way of the really common way in handwriting to make sure that everybody knows it's an L, a lowercase L, is to just make it cursive. That's chlorine. That's carbon and iodine. So you may have to adjust your handwriting. I always have one or two people that like to write in all caps, and I always have some people that like to make their capitals just a bigger version of a lowercase letter. You can't do that for atomic symbols. I'll let that slide on units as long as you're clear with yourself. But with symbols, atomic symbols, you have to make it really obvious. All right, so, and again, I'll give you some leeway as to how you do that, but you can't just do that for your else. And you can't write, um, so arsenic is AS. You can't write it like that. You have to make it clear that that's an uppercase and that's lower. S is the one that's actually the hardest. You have to use size squared. There's no other way to, to do S commonly. At least you could do it as a cursive S. Um, but for whatever reason, that's it's not as big of a deal with S as it is with L and I. L and I are really hard to keep track if you're not careful. Um, most of the symbols are based on the English name. Um, a few of them are not, especially for elements that have, were discovered a long time um, before English was the most common language. Um, they're written in, the symbols are actually based on their Latin names for the most part. It's like AU is gold because the Latin word for gold is aurum, A-U-R-U-M. Um, and same for sodium, the Latin word for sodium is natrium. So there's a lot of the ones that don't match where the symbol doesn't match the name. It's because it's based on something Latin um, or something else that's, that's um, sometimes other language. The one that I know is a different language than Latin is uh, tungsten. Does anybody know what the symbol for tungsten is off the top of your head? Not to you. That'd be too easy. W. W for tungsten because tungsten was discovered almost simultaneously in the UK and or in England at the time and in Germany. And so they settled on the Germans get to pick the, the symbol for it and the English get to pick the name for it. So the English picked tungsten, the German word for tungsten is Wolfram. So W for the symbol. Um, when it comes to remembering these, this is one of, going to be one of the few places where I just say point blank, you have to memorize this um, because it's really, really frustrating for everybody involved um, when you do things like mix up fluorine and fluorovium because 
fluorine is just F and fluorovium is FL. If you don't have that down pat, you're going to confuse yourself um, and get wrong answers. So with that in mind, a week from today, we'll have an in-class quiz, closed book, and this will be the one time I take away your periodic table. Um, you don't have to memorize where everything goes. You just have to be able to convert back and forth between the symbol and the name. For, let's see where I usually cut it off. Let me pull up a periodic table. So we're all looking at, at a periodic table while I'm saying this. Where are all my, oh, they're in the other folder. Sorry, my Dropbox is, is a mess. I'm a, a bit of a digital hoarder. Um, because why would you ever delete a file? It doesn't even take up any space. So if we're looking at our periodic table, uh, for this class, we'll say row six, starting with cesium and up. So everything from radon down to hydrogen. You have to be able to go from the symbol to the name or name to the symbol. Right? And I do give partial credit, as you guys know at this point. It's not going to be all or nothing um, on these. Um, but that don't forget, and we'll talk about why this is next week. This is part of row six. The first row here is part of row six. When you get past row six, everything is synthetic elements for the most part, other than uranium. Um, so we won't worry about row seven at this point, but everything up to 86 and look at the atomic numbers here. This bottom section, we think of it as being two other rows. It actually is supposed to fit in right there. But if you expand it and make it wide, it doesn't print well on a letter size sheet of paper. So they basically took these middle two, this, these two rows, and instead of leaving them in the middle where they're supposed to go, they bumped them down here just so it would fit better. Right, so this is part of row six. Right, and so the way that I would approach this, so there's, a, there's a Quizlet that, um, that's linked in the resources section, I'm pretty sure, um, that I've, has already made some flashcards, make your own flashcards, um, you know, play Sporkle quizzes you know, do online, online quizzes to test yourself on this sort of thing. Um, you, I'm not just going to hand you a blank piece of a blank periodic table and have you fill it out. I couldn't do that. I don't expect you to be able to do that. What I do expect you to do is, is if I say iridium to know that that's IR. So no memorizing numbers at all. All numbers are off the table. Just to make that totally clear. Just the symbols and names. So the way the quiz will be, it'll be you know, 20, 20 times where I give you the name, you write the symbol, 10 where I write the symbol, you write the name. Be next, sorry, I said next Thursday, didn't I? Next Wednesday. All my other chemistry classes are Tuesday, Thursday, so. All right, so I think that that's enough lead time. Most of these, a lot of these, you probably already know whether you realize it or not. Calcium is CA. You probably don't need to study that one that much. That's a common enough element name um, that once you see that once on the flashcard, you're not gonna need to study it again. And one of my favorite ways to remember the ones where the name does not match the symbol is to learn the story behind it. Because if you know the story behind it, like tungsten is W, then at the very least, it'll stick in your head is, oh, that's one of the exceptions, even if you have, you have to guess on what the exception is or you know, what it's supposed to be. Um, silver is AG, is Argentum in Latin. Um, and I bring that up because mercury is related to that. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature, right? So mercury, they, the classical name for mercury is hydro argentum, which means literally liquid silver, quicksilver. It's where the term quicksilver comes from, is from the Latin word for mercury, right? So 
if you learn some of these stories, I find that that makes it a lot, a lot less tedious um, when it comes to memorizing the exceptions. Um, maybe I'm grasping at straws, but, and again, this is one of very few times where, just, where I just say, sorry, you have to memorize it um, without just giving you a reason or uh, a cheat sheet. And once you show me you understand that, I'll never take your periodic table away again. It'll be your safety blanket for the rest of any chemistry classes you have. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the rest of this, um, about these other, these are what are called the subatomic particles. So subatomic, meaning smaller than atoms. And our, the three that we care about, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Varying all those three things gives you every type of matter that we have. If you vary the number of protons, you change the atomic number, which means you change what element you have. If you took, if you took a proton away from lithium, lithium is number three up there. If you took a proton away from it, it's not lithium anymore. It's helium. So this is one of the ways, this is one of the reasons that um, uh, we, you wind up with radon coming up through the ground in, in areas with lots of granite is because the uranium that is buried in the soil, naturally occurring uranium, when it decays, one of its byproducts that it makes is radon. But you went from uranium that's a metal or an ore, it's found underground as a solid, to something that's found as a gas. And so it kind of bubbles up through the granite because granite has lots of little cracks in it because it's no longer uranium. It changed the number of protons. And so now all of a sudden it's radon. Not all, all of a sudden. I say all of a sudden, it's, we're talking about something that has a half-life of four and a half billion years. Um, so it's not like it's you know, gonna jump out at you. It's very, very slow. Um, so, if you vary the other subatomic particles, if you vary the number of electrons, you don't change what element you have because you didn't touch the number of protons. An element is defined by protons. If you change the number of electrons though, you get something where the charge doesn't add up to zero anymore. If you've taken away an electron from something, then you lost a negative charge. When you lose a negative, what's left? positive. So it's like minus a negative, right? Double negative cancels out. When you lose an electron, you get a positive charge on what's left, which I realize is backwards. And it's not my fault. I'm sorry. It's Ben Franklin's fault. He was the one who originally decided when he did his experiment showing what charge was. He took a piece of rabbit fur and a piece of glass and he rubbed the rabbit fur on the glass and demonstrated that that there was a change in charge between the two, we generated static electricity by doing that. And he just arbitrarily said, this charge is positive and that charge is negative. And you got it wrong. You get a 50-50 chance and you got it wrong. So now we have to deal with the fact that you lose an electron and your charge goes up, right? So just have to pay attention to that. When you change the charge, that's, you make what's called an ion. An ion is anytime you've got an atom or a group of atoms that has a net charge, where you've got a mismatch between the number of protons and electrons. And so ions can be negative and ions can be positive. And in fact, just to define it before I use the term confuse you, if you have something with a positive charge, it's called a cation. Something with a negative charge, it's called an anion. Um, those come from the same roots as cathode and anode in batteries. But the way I always remember it is that cation, the T looks like a plus. And anion stands for a negative ion. It doesn't really stand for that, but you can remember it that way. Um, you know, people get creative, overly cute with it sometimes. It's a cation because I like cats and therefore that's a positive thing. That seems like extra work to me. Plus looks like a T or the T looks like a plus. Seems easier, but everybody has their own preference with that. 
So that's two of our subatomic particles. We vary proton, we vary the element, we vary the number of electrons, we vary the charge, and we make an ion. If we vary the number of neutrons, we didn't change the charge because neutrons are neutral. We didn't change the element because we didn't change the protons. The only thing that changes if you change the neutron is the mass of the nucleus. And so it still behaves more or less the same way, but you make what's, um, the, if you're specifying a specific number of neutrons, you're talking about a specific isotope. So mostly when we look at the periodic table, we're looking at a mixture. If you look at the mass for for these. So for instance, carbon has a mass number of 12.011. Well, what that's actually showing us is that if you took a whole bunch of carbon atoms and you weighed them out, on average, they're going to have a certain mass. But really, it's a mixture of two different isotopes. It's a mixture of carbon-13 and carbon-12 that have, and the only difference between them is how many neutrons are in the nucleus. They behave identically. They just weigh a little bit different, right? So a different isotope has a different number of neutrons. So quick quiz question from somebody last week is, is it possible there are more elements we have not found yet? Well, not in, not between one and 118, because every number, every atomic number between hydrogen and, I'm not even sure how to pronounce this one, because nobody ever talks about these ones. Oganeson, Oganeson. Every number is accounted for, right? Which means there's no way you could have something hiding in the middle with a part of a proton. If protons are limited to only being whole numbers, there's nothing in between here. There could be new elements we haven't discovered that are past 118. In fact, that there are, we just have, don't know how to make them yet or what their properties will be. Um, but really the part, this part of the periodic table is filled in quite, quite uniformly. Um, one of the ones that, where there used to be a gap on the periodic table is down here at 43. Technetium is the smallest of the synthetic elements. The parentheses basically mean that it's it's called a synthetic element because it's not found in nature. Basically, they they knew there was a gap, and they so they had to make technetium by slamming together other nuclei. Um, technetium it tech, it is naturally occurring, just not on Earth. It has a short enough half life. It's radioactive and has a short enough half life that, but by the time we knew to look for it, it had already decayed. It was already gone from our solar system. But the, the supernova that made all the material that in our solar system made some technetium as well. It just disappeared before we knew, even knew to look for it. So now we can make technetium, um, but it's still a synthetic element in that you're not going to find it mixed in in you know any of the ores or in you know in mine tailings or anything like that. Sam. Oh, thank you. I forget that that one's not. Yeah. Magnetic board. All right. So let's talk about the periodic table a little bit more. I almost did the same thing again, didn't I? Um, so the way that the periodic table that we're going to use for this class is set up, it's uh, in this order. This is not you know, unique in any way. It just is the way that I thought it looked best when I made this periodic table. Um, other periodic tables have them in different orders, but you can always re recognize the, the atomic number versus the mass number because the atomic number always has to be an integer. And the mass numbers are always going to be decimals because that's a measured number. Atomic number is not measured. It's exact. It has to be, you can't have a part of a proton. So, if we have an argon atom, 
It's neutrally charged. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons do we have? I thought they were done with demo. <clears throat> so protons is easy, right? If you've got a periodic table, protons is literally just look at the atomic number. That is your number of protons. And everything else comes from that. If you know how many protons you have, and you know the charge, you know how many electrons you have. So if it's neutral, then if you, so the symbol for a proton is a lowercase p with a positive charge, um, lowercase so that you don't mix it up with phosphorus, and a neutron is a lowercase n with a zero as a superscript because that's indicating that it has no charge. An electron is the one you see this the most, and usually it's the lowercase e with a negative sign as an exponent. So, for this sample, or for this example, we have 18 protons because it's argon. The fact that it's argon tells us that, even if you have to go look it up on the periodic table. The number of electrons we know because we know the charge. Keep going. We're almost done. How many electrons? 18. That easy. And that's an exact number, too, right? Because we couldn't be off by a part of an electron. Yeah. So if you say, like, this is R down with a positive charge, would you assume that the charge is going to S? So if we don't, if you don't specify the charge, you assume it's plus one. Sometimes in biology textbooks, you'll see things like, um, you know, phosph phosphate is normally has a three minus charge. Occasionally, you'll see it written like that with three minuses, but that's really old school and confusing. So, if it's a charge other than one, you'll see minus three. Just specify what it is. Sometimes they flip the order of those, and that's just based on kerning to make it so that it's not, not confusing. Because if you write bromine, if you type bromine with a negative one, a lot of times that minus sign winds up fusing into the R and you wind up not being able to tell that there's a, a minus sign there. So sometimes you'll see it written as one minus means the exact same thing. It just for convenience sake, sometimes it's easier to switch the charge sign and the number for it. But yeah, if, if you have, if you know how many protons you have, and you know what your overall charge is, figuring out electrons is easy, right? It takes a little bit of practice, but once once you get the hang of the fact that electrons are negative, then it's pretty straightforward. In this case, if any time it's neutral, it's really easy. Yeah. And as far as neutrons, sometimes you'll have a specific isotope that's given to you. And sometimes, and like in this case, it just says in an argon atom with a neutral charge. If it doesn't specify a specific isotope, then it means the most common isotope, which means you just look at the mass number. And if the mass number should be really close to a whole number, if there's one most common isotope, and you just round it to the nearest integer and say, okay, all of the things that take up that make up the mass are either a proton or a neutron, and their masses are about the same. So if the average mass of an argon atom is about 40, and 18 of that mass is protons, how many neutrons are there? 22. It's just a difference between the mass number and the number of protons. And more commonly, I'll, especially if I'm asking a question like this, I'll specify a specific isotope so you don't have to make a judgment call because there are certain elements that the atomic mass is not close to a whole number. Chlorine is one in particular. Chlorine has a mass of 35.457. That's not really close to a whole number, right? And that's because naturally occurring chlorine is a mixture of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. And so with that in mind, 
you can't just use the, that number to figure out the number of neutrons in that case. I would want to specify in chlorine 37, which is written out this way for the abbreviation, you put the 37 up into the left of the symbol. So charge is written up into the right. How many atoms you have is down into the right. And the mass number of an isotope is written up into the left. If that's not specified, that means you just have the, the naturally occurring mixture. So we call that the statistical mixture, um, where it might be something like, you know, 75% of them are carbon 35 and 25% of them are carbon 39. 37, sorry. All right, so in, if this is the case, if I tell you what the mass number is, it's a whole number and you just do the same thing. Figure out how many protons you have, take your mass number, subtract the protons, and that gives you your number of neutrons. And so just to recap, Elements are defined by the number of protons. Ions are defined by the net charge. In other words, number of electrons you have. And the isotopes are defined by the total particles in the nucleus. So this 37 number is the sum of the protons and the neutrons. It's all of the objects that have mass. They all have a mass of about one. So for counting purposes, we can just say that a neutron and a proton weigh the same amount. It's not exactly true, but it's close enough for now. And if you want more details, you can go into to theoretical physics. Turns out something about the way one of the quarks is faced changes the charge on it and also changes the mass just slightly. It also means Questions like this are pretty straightforward if I give you the number of, or the mass number. So let's say it's nitrogen 14, zinc, I don't know, zinc 68, sulfur 33, sodium, do sodium? 10 and bromine 78. So filling this in, it's pretty straightforward if you have a periodic table and you know what the numbers mean, right? Until this lecture, it would have been really, really hard to do this because you would have been trying to teach yourself. Um, so that's a plug for YouTube can't totally replace my job. So what's the atomic number for N? Seven. So how many protons does it have? Seven. If there's no charge given, you can assume it's neutral. So therefore, seven electrons. We'll add a column here for neutrons at the end. And what's the element name? Hydrogen. And if we're specifying an isotope, usually you would throw the isotope number on the end. So nitrogen 14 be as specific as possible. The element name is just nitrogen. The isotope name is nitrogen 14. What about 68 ZN? What, 30, 30? So how many protons? Again, no charge, therefore, And once you take next week's quiz, this will come naturally to you. But if you have your periodic table in front of you, you know it's zinc. We'll say it's zinc 68. 
I'm sorry, we didn't specify number of um, neutrons for nitrogen 14. How many neutrons do we have? Also seven. A lot of times your number of protons and neutrons are the same. And also a lot of times your number of protons and electrons is the same, which leads to people getting these mixed up. Protons and neutrons add up to give you your mass number. Protons and electrons gives you your charge. I always have somebody make some, makes a, a mistake. Um, they just forget and they compare your number of neutrons and your mass to the number of electrons, for instance, instead of protons. It's easy to do. They won't always be the same though. So for zinc 68, how many neutrons do we have? Just 38. Protons plus neutrons has to add up to 68. Uh, let's look at the sodium one, just to get to one where the charge. What's the atomic number? 11. So how many protons? 11. How many electrons? 10. So the name would just be sodium 10. How many neutrons? Sorry, it shouldn't be sodium 10. Uh, sodium, sodium 23. Sorry, sodium 10 is not a thing. So with that quick adjustment, how many neutrons do we have? Neutrons plus protons has to add up to 23. And let's do bromine 78. Atomic number? 35. I don't know, it doesn't like the, that spot where I was trying to write the three. That's a three, which means 35 protons. We have a negative one charge, which means what? One extra electron. So 36 electrons. And how many neutrons? 78 minus 35, so 43. All right, so that is the bulk of the homework questions and it's gonna be the bulk of the quiz questions this week is can you look at a periodic table or if I give you a table like this, can you fill it out properly? And I won't always give you this over here. I could give you protons, neutrons, and electrons and have you fill in the symbol and the name. All right. Um, this is like a five-minute topic, so bear with me. We'll go through this quickly because we have to cover it at some point. Um, Pure substances versus mixtures. So a pure substance means that you always have the exact same ratio of elements present. So elements are the simplest form of a pure substance because how can you get more pure than having every atom is the same type of atom, right? That's always, it's always in a 100% ratio. It's always the same atom. But if you have a mixture of atoms and they're always present in the same ratio, it's going to be a compound instead of an element. All right, so compounds are made up of multiple elements always combined in the same ratio. Um, and you can't change that ratio. If you change that ratio, you change what that substance is. So for instance, water is H2O, two hydrogens to one oxygen, always connected the same way. You can't have a little bit more hydrogen. If you add a little bit more hydrogen, 
you have to add the right number of oxygens to go with it. If you added a whole nother oxygen, maybe H2O2, that's now hydrogen peroxide. That's a different compound because it's different whole number ratio of elements. And same with sodium chloride, table salt. If sodium chloride is one sodium ion for every one chloride ion. You can't get extra sodium. You can't get low sodium salt. If you get low sodium salt, what they're really doing is replacing some of the sodium with potassium version. So it's not actually salt at that point. It's not sodium chloride. The sodium chloride has to be at the same ratio. Um, the difference between water and hydrogen peroxide leads to the, the classic chemistry joke. Two chemists walk into a bar. And the first one says, I'll have H2O. And the bartender gives him a glass of water. And the second chemist says, I'll have H2O too. And the bartender, and then he takes a drink and he kills him or dies. Right? There's a various ways you can end that joke. It doesn't end very cleanly. Basically, don't drink hydrogen peroxide. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. H2O is water. I'll have to clean that up a little. There's a better way to do that. Um, if you have... If you have a mixture of elements, but you can vary how much you have, it's not a compound, it's a mixture. So if you could add in a little bit more of something and it's still the same compound or the same um, type of material, then it's a mixture. So for instance, brass is a mixture. Brass is a mixture of zinc and copper. If you add it in the right ratio, you get brass. If you tweak the ratio a little bit, you get bronze instead. I think there's a couple other things in there too. But effectively, you can adjust that ratio because all you're doing is mixing the things together and they're not making um, a pure compound like you have here. So the atmosphere is a mixture. It's a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. You go to different places, different, different planets, you can have an atmosphere that has a different ratio of oxygen to nitrogen. That makes it a mixture. The fact that you could tweak that just a little bit. Technically, this picture right here of hydrogen peroxide and vitamin store is a mixture. It's, got, it's a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and water. The stuff you buy at the store is 3% hydrogen peroxide by mass. You can buy it up to a 20% hydrogen peroxide by mass. It's two different compounds, and the ratio of those compounds to each other can be changed. And that's what makes it a mixture. Last vocab word, heterogeneous and homogeneous. Heterogeneous just means that different parts of your mixture have different ratios. Homogeneous means that everything is uniformly mixed. So if I go back here, if I grab, if we let this settle, the water with oil poured in, with the mixture, if I grab a molecule from the very top, it's more likely to be oil. If I grab a molecule from the bottom, it's more likely to be water. That means it's heterogeneous, it's not homogeneous. If it was evenly mixed so that I had equal probability of grabbing oil or water anywhere, then it's homogeneous. All right, thanks for hanging out for an extra minute, and I'll see half of you in lab in a few minutes. <laughs>